Ah, I'm Kat. And I'm Haley. And this is Ah, Night Classy. Ah, tipsy night class teaching the oddities and ah, curiosities you never learned in school. Ah, what are you teaching on this learning journey, Haley? I am teaching a court case from the 40s that is still surprisingly and unfortunately relevant today. Oh, sounds like fun. I think we'll have a lot of fun riffing on it. Okay. My lesson is less fun. I'm going to be telling you about what happens when you give a colony of mice access to unlimited resources, but limited space. Oh, no. The it cheese war is not cute. 1912. <laughs> Pre-trigger warning for animal cruelty. No. Yeah. I, that was sarcasm. Oh. See, you, don't, you just don't get me. I don't get you. I'm too good at it. You're too... Uh, um... Stone cold. Stone Killer. cold. Serious. Yes. The I'm sarcasm very, doesn't touch your eyes. Very serious person. <laughs> you it doesn't. Fool me every time. My lights are on. No one's home. I think that's what you just said. I think basically. there's no one home in my brain. Yeah. You're checked out. You're like, all right, time for night class. Let me flip the switch and let my, my evil twin run the show. I'm on autopilot. I just came down from a lot of adrenaline. So. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. Screenshotting receipt sending adrenaline. Yeah, re yeah, receipt sending adrenaline is the mood at the moment. I'd rather have a receipt than no receipts. So oh, I have receipts. Uh -huh. I had receipts on receipts. And guess what? I haven't gotten a response yet, which is hmm, weird. A change from the original audacity. Yeah, the original <laughs> audacity came in strong. And I shut it down. And then they got jacked. Ah. <laughs> oh, okay, well, that was fun. I'm so curious. Fun. You, you have a name that you need oh, to what? pronounce that I've been... <laughs> Anxiously I'm waiting. I'm so sorry, Niam. So I just wanted to Niam. share with Hay Niam. <laughs> we Someone sent me this beautiful creation they made, and I'm excited to share it with Haley. Their name is spelled N-I-A-M, and we were discussing how to say it, and we'd settled on Niam. 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 <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. I'm terrible. Okay. Uh, they made a night classy drinking game, a new updated version. Are you serious? Yes. No. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm so glad you didn't see the Instagram DM and I get to be the one to. I don't even have the login. Shine for this our light Instagram. on you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So you guys Great. could be like planning my downfall in the night classy Instagram. Well, and I that's never awkward because we are. I've been. Uh, Why would you I've been say looking that? for a host to replace you with on Instagram. Why don't you go to I the made my stories. Corner. I made our night classy stories secret from you, <laughs> and I've been uh, scouting. That's so rude. That's why you didn't repost my night classy post the other day. What mm. night classy post? It was a throwback with the fireworks of us. Oh, I did not see that. I'm mm. never on Instagram. Because I got blocked. Oh. Blocked by my own page. <laughs> yeah. That's Ye probably... Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Well, she made a drinking game. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. How do we play? Okay. So take a drink if blowing over 0 0.08 or at 0, 0, 0 which <laughs> already no take a drink because we're both at 0, 0, 0. Mispronounce a word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely mispronounce your name. Drinking box wine. Check. We yeah. have our block red wine from Trader Joe's right here. Plug Patreon. Patreon's what we do, baby. It's That's how we make the big bucks. How we make that bread. That's why we're rich. Mm, Live so rich. Lavish lifestyle. <laughs> Plug Patreon in parentheses. Take two drinks of advertising cocktail hour. Mm. Al Alec interjects. Excuse me? There we go. <laughs> Sky Daddy mentioned COVID. Look at a picture and say, oh, he's hot or no, he's not. <laughs> you're hot or you're not. What What else is there well, to say? Well, often I think one of us thinks someone's hot and the other is like, no, he's not. That's true. That's mm -hmm. true. I feel like we do kind of have different tastes. But also not because Tommy and Alec are very similar. Similar. <laughs> similar. Like, yeah. Dark hair, dark eyes, but skinny, otherwise, pale, older. Yeah. 
<laughs> Tommy's Sorry, f- I did not mean for that to come across <laughs> as unflattering. That's my type. Tommy's the first skinny da- skinny guy I think I've ever dated. Okay, you're stepping out of your comfort zone. I stepped zone. out of my comfort zone. Yeah, mm. his personality won me over. <laughs> his personality is big enough to make up for his body. Oh, no, there's no making up to be had or Just, needed. But yeah, <laughs> I love him exactly how he is. He has been doing Pilates, though, and he's like getting muscles wow (laughs) alec and i were just talking about how we're gonna start doing pilates yeah there's a yoga spot down the street from that new place we're moving into Mm -hmm. wow you guys are way fancier than we are we do a youtube university we'll probably do we'll probably do that too in our apartment right now there's not even space to like do an indoor workout so we're looking forward to spreading our wings that'll be nice pilates will kick your ass i'm sure i haven't done any form of physical activity in years horse riding is yeah there's that kind of i mean you're sitting but (laughs) oh it's hard it is it's hard sitting there you go (laughs) Uh, also known as sex Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Sky Daddy mentioned COVID. Oh, I already read that part. What's for dinner? Uh, I ask you guys that every Tuesday, even off the air. I can't believe you do. That made every it time in. we're leaving the studio, you ask us that. I'm a creature of habit. Which, by the way, Alec, what are you making me for dinner tonight? You got to tell me the options. I can never remember. Okay, we'll talk about this later. <laughs> talk about being, quote unquote, old, math troubles, cryptid mention, two oh. drinks if dog man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's always dog man. <laughs> Which we've been talking about like a new uh, Patreon show where Alec will teach us lessons. And he made a joke last night that it's going to be dog man every single time. <laughs> <laughs> I think you probably know enough about yeah, Dogman to did. make that happen. <laughs> yeah, he's just recapping other people's Dogman encounter yeah. podcast episodes. The Dogman. Uh, the Ogman Dogman. Yes. Oh, I think go. that we should be the name whether you cover Dogman or not. Cra- <laughs> the craziest <laughs> Patreon name. Welcome we to Ogman Dogman. <laughs> <laughs> It's me, Ogman, the dog man. Woof. <laughs> oh, woo. All right. Disgusto Barfo, mention of Ohio or Washington, reference to an old episode, complain about white wine. You know, we haven't done that in a while. Well, I have a lot to say, so I could go on and on. It's You're too a stupid sugary. bitch if you drink white wine. <laughs> You don't have taste. (laughs) We don't respect you. You're tasteless. (laughs) Reddit slash Wikipedia as a source. Uh, Not safe for work content. Take a sidebar from the topic. Take two drinks if the sidebar is about cats or horses, anxiety or depressants, (laughs) Accutane, complaining about bangs, a TV show, three if it's Bachelor, Bachelorette, something spooky or witchy, or referencing a previous episode. Do not play this game. You will have to get your stomach (laughs) pumped. You will die. Hopefully you're not drinking a white wine because that'll just make it worse. That's instant death. (laughs) Finish the drink or long chug if, almost did the same topic, Patreon pick, spooky, witchy, true crime topic, commercial break, question mark, three, two, one, <laughs> class dismissed. <laughs> that is so beautiful. I know. I love that so much. We're so predictable. It's true. We are who we are, and clearly um, it comes across to the audience. Yeah, Very. I'm glad we have a brand. <laughs> Always be branding. Oh, gosh, I love the sidebars about cats, dogs, depressants, anxiety, Accutane, complaining about bangs. That's all my interests. <laughs> I've been right complaining there. about bangs. <laughs> there was a picture recommended to me on Pinterest. And it's just someone's drawing and it's a cloud floating away and the sun is like wiping off its head like it's been sweating. It's like, whoo, wasn't that some depression? (laughs) (laughs) It's cute. I'll have to find it. Also, I feel bad. I want to go back and I know nobody cares about this but me. But when I said Tommy's personality makes up for his body, I did not mean his body was bad. I meant that you aren't usually with skinny guys. So he's physically smaller and his personality (laughs) makes him bigger and more more like what your I former type is. Okay. I hope everyone I just, else I just don't too. want anyone to think I'm body shaming Tommy. Because yeah, that would yeah, be yeah. really rude. And <laughs> I'm not doing that. Yeah, definitely not. Okay, I got good. that. Okay. I'm but sure yeah. I'm sure you got it. I just wanted to cover my bases here. <laughs> That's fair. Okay. Because you get canceled very easily in this this culture. Ugh. 
the woke. cancel culture. Woke cancel this culture. Woke fascist. Biden's woke culture. <laughs> I can't wait for someone to cancel me and then I can just chill. Like, <laughs> yeah. There's no coming back. Yeah, there's no going back. I don't have to worry anymore. <laughs> and then whoever sticks with you, it's like, you know, the real ones. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, you, you can't have me at my best if you haven't seen me at my worst or whatever the fuck that is. I swear is. to God, you should be a PR person. <laughs> you know how to just spin things. That's what you you do you're a twister i'm a twister in the best way mm. i love it make everything a positive uh, <laughs> just kidding i love to complain true but also you bring it up towards the okay. end of the complaining you okay. get it out yeah. like today you're like well this 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 and this but it's fine how was your day <laughs> <laughs> my day was a sandwich of bad yeah it was yeah. bad good bad bad and now it's good again there we go triple decker yeah Is now i triple? feel good how many pieces of bread are there that's what i need to know well, do you like Big Macs? I have no idea. Okay. I've never had been interested in Big Macs. I'll help you out. No, they're bad. Okay. They, the bread in the middle gets soggy. Mm, Not good. Have That's you fair. had one? I've had one. Okay, here's the story. Whoa. No. <laughs> Not with meat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I was a little, I really wanted to try a Big Mac, but I've always been vegetarian. So I ordered a Big Mac with no patties. So it was literally <laughs> just a bread and mayo sandwich, which maybe that's why the bread in the middle was soggy. Uh, um, yeah. It did have the it Big did Mac have... is the signature <laughs> McDonald's item. They probably at McDonald's thought I was crazy. I was like six. You can't blame me. My mm. grandma's the one who let it happen. I remember. Grandma. She was the one who ordered it for me. <laughs> <laughs> my parents always made me order my own food. I, yeah, I probably I, or, I probably ordered it. Unless we were in the drive-thru, then she would have had to say it. Yeah. I think. I don't know. My mom would have us, like, yell out the window. She'd, like, <laughs> she roll out the back the window. Drive-thru. Yeah. She, I mean, I feel like we were constantly being prepped to be adults. adults. Yeah. yeah. I was forced to order my own food at restaurants, definitely. You Please can't and tell. thank you. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. It didn't do anything for my social skills or fear of strangers. That's, that's if anything, it probably made it worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. I have no idea where we were, but we need to make that game, that list of when to drink. We need to make a cute graphic for it. Yeah, we do. Um, That's exactly what I said. That is exactly what you said. I'm on it. Mm Mm-hmm. I I had an idea for it yesterday too, and I've completely forgotten, so I shouldn't have said anything because now I was thinking like a carousel on Instagram that you could swipe through, Mm. or you read it on video. I could add graphics to that. Okay. Either way. And just like an actual thing, like we could print out, I don't know, maybe just for the us. The old PDF. It, yeah, get it laminated. <laughs> okay, cute, right? cute. Yeah, we can have a little dry race. <laughs> yeah, step three, profit. So. Step one, PDF. Step two, laminate. Step three, profit. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck bitches, get money. <laughs> I got really rich laminating PDFs in the early 2000s. <laughs> I was the first in the PDF game. <laughs> I was the first to laminate a PDF. <laughs> Usually they're digital files. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't even get me started on the TIFFs. <laughs> Why? That's a thing, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think it is. Something like a dot in, in photography. Yeah, uh, I believe you. Long, long silence. My brain froze. Okay, grows. you I'm saw sorry. me taking a sip of uh, water. I, I, You're I, I, supposed I, to fill the I silence. Know, I don't know why my brain I, was just like. <laughs> I went. I really have to take a sip of water. I know Haley's got me. And Slowly I was... reach the water bottle to my face so she knows. <laughs> and then I she was just so stares. <laughs> I did just there. My brain checked out. I was like, what is she doing? <laughs> <laughs> What's she going to do with the water bottle? <laughs> going to hit you over the head with it. <laughs> I was going to jump in with a Tiff as MILF scenario where T-I-F-F was like a M-I-L-F scenario, but I couldn't do the math in my head of what a Tiff would be. So it made Titties. the silence even. <laughs> I'd freaking... 
<laughs> titties I'd fuck. Titties I'd freaking fuck. Oh my god. It's that easy, Alex. Like, it's so easy. Yeah. What you We're thinking? good at coming up with things. Like we names like, for your Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kaylee and I sat here and suggested about twenty names each for Alex's new Patreon segment. He declined every single He's, one. And then he goes, I think I'll go on Facebook and ask like our listeners what they think after he just rejected a hundred suggestions from him. Haley and, and I. Here's what he said. He said, "We'll workshop it." Yeah, that's what he said to each one. So rude. Uh, Literally so rude. I just rude. didn't want to commit to the principal's corner, which is what they were. <laughs> no, we said principal's <laughs> office. <laughs> Both would be good. <laughs> the principal there's, doesn't have a corner. There's a bit on the show where it's like, if we do something that you don't approve of, you say principal's corner. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, we could call it detention. Oh, he's looking at yeah. me like he hates it. ISS, ISS, <laughs> ISS, ISS. Let the listeners workshop it. <laughs> okay. For reference, Alec is going to be starting his very own Patreon show. We're doing some reworking of the perks and the tiers. Um, so drink now because we mentioned Patreon. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to teach an episode every week. Every excuse me. Whoa. Every wow. Week. That's a big commitment. Ooh, Alex, join me. Oh, that is so nice become, of you. Yeah, so we're triangular shape now. Every yeah. month, we have a third host. Every month I'm going to teach a lesson on, on Patreon. Yes. Every month, four times a month, every week. So Start what, do we, what do we call it? You decide. Well, I think you we decide. know who will have the final word. And then he'll workshop it. I've decided with titties I'd freaking fuck. <laughs> the final decision. And I'm going to let you have that. Og.tiff. <laughs> Og.tiff. <laughs> <laughs> Tiff's corner. <laughs> oh no! Ugh, that put a bad, scary image in my mind. ISS dot T I F F. That sounds accurate. I mean, I was never an ISS, but it seemed scary. Yeah, I was never an ISS either. I had lunch detention like twice for chewing gum, and that was it. Bad gal. I know. I, I cried when I got detention for forgetting my vocabulary book <laughs> in my locker. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I was sensitive. I am sensitive. Yeah. I'll own that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Are we ready to get to the beef of the show? Yeah. Yeah. The the meatless patty of the show. <laughs> <laughs> the bread, the soggy middle bread of the show. <laughs> the most essential piece. So as I stated to you guys, I meant to write this whole opening for my lesson, but when I finished my notes last night, I forgot about writing the <laughs> opening. <laughs> so I'm just going to read a short article from history.com <laughs> for my opening. Okay. Okay. <laughs> the year was 1924. That's how this article starts. That's how I'm starting oh, the article. Okay. I was like, I wow, had, that's quite Here's the... how the article starts. Okay. And it wouldn't make sense without you knowing the context. Uh, 14-year-old Bobby Franks is abducted from a Chicago, Illinois street and killed in what later proves to be one of the most unusual murders in American history. The killers, Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb, were wealthy and intelligent teenagers whose sole motive for killing Franks was the desire to commit the perfect crime. You see, Leopold, who graduated from the University of Chicago at age 18, spoke nine languages and had an IQ of 200. Is that a lot? Yeah, I think average is 100. Oh, embarrassing. Yeah, it's a little too smart. Um, And he had issues of his own. Purportedly, he had perverse sexual desires. Loeb, also unusually gifted, graduated from college at 17 and was fascinated with criminal psychology. The two made an unusual pact. Loeb, who was gay, agreed to participate in Leopold's eccentric sexual practices in return for Leopold's cooperation with his criminal endeavors. Both were convinced that their intelligence and social privilege exempted them from the laws that bound other people. In 1924, the pair began to put the maxim to the test by planning to commit a perfect murder. They each established false identities and began rehearsing the kidnapping and murder. Loeb stabbed Bobby Franks, who was actually his distant cousin... (gasps) several times in the back seat of a rented car as Leopold drove through Chicago's heavy traffic. 
horrific, but it's already not the perfect crime because they killed someone connected to them. I'm not sure that he knew this was his distant cousin. Wait, how? I don't know. Do you know your fourth cousins? I guess not. Yeah. But like, just what are the odds that from you the randomly? Yeah, I think kill they your just own cousin. Randomly grab someone. What the fuck? I mean, it was not the perfect murder for a lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> After Frank's bled to death on the floor of the car, Leopold and Loeb threw his body in a previously scouted swamp and then disposed of the other evidence in various locations. In an attempt to throw police off their trail, they sent a ransom note demanding $10,000 to Frank's wealthy father. Never, not the ransom note. That, it's too far. It, it never works. Like, are it's, you that smart? This is so far the most generic crime. Very. In no way the perfect crime. And the sinisterness of how they wanted to commit the perfect crime. Not yeah. even like they just had this desire and they thought that they were so smart that they could get away with it. Yeah, it seems like they're doing this to like get off on how smart they are. Yeah, But exactly. like, you know, even if they did get away with it, they would never be able to keep their fucking mouth shut about it. Like yeah, they just so want to brag. Proud. Oh yeah, just wait. They do the typical thing where they like try and help the investigation. Of course. Leopold and Loeb made a couple of key mistakes. First, the body, which was poorly hidden, was discovered the next day. <laughs> <laughs> this prompted an immediate search for the killers, which Loeb himself joined. Obviously, like you do. Obviously. And a fucking swamp. Like, I would shit, almost. That, don't swamps like preserve a body? Yeah. So, definitely. He's probably just floating at the surface, chilling on the li- lily pads. So dumb. The typewriter used to type the ransom note was recovered from a lake. And more important, a pair of glasses was found near Frank's body. When the glasses were traced to Loeb's optometrist, police learned that the optometrist had only written three of the same prescriptions. Two were immediately accounted for, and the third belonged to Nathan Leopold, who calmly told detectives he must have dropped them while bird hunting earlier in the week. This explanation might have provided sufficient, but reporters covering the case soon discovered other letters from Leopold and matched the ransom note. When confronted with this evidence, Leopold and Loeb both confess. <laughs> that didn't take long. <laughs> Not at all. They're like, oh, okay, we don't know what to do now. We've already committed the perfect crime. Do, I know that they're, they probably have issues that make it impossible for them to see their own flaws uh, just based on this profile you've painted. But don't you just want them to like realize they're f- fucking idiots? Like, yeah, it would at feel what good. point mm-hmm. they're almost like, well, this is somebody else's fault. This isn't how it's supposed to go. We yeah. did the per- we did this perfectly. Right. It's not our fault. It just went wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If all these other outside factors separate from us wouldn't have happened. Right. Yeah. I think they definitely had had issues. Oh yeah. I <laughs> well, think it clearly takes a they lot did. of issues to do what they did. <laughs> Clarence Darrow agreed to defend Leopold, and the trial soon began or became a national sensation. Darrow, the author who didn't argue the boy's innocence, directed one of his most famous orations during the death penalty against the death penalty itself. The judge was swayed and imposed life sentences. Apparently unsatisfied with the attorney's work, Leopold's father later reneged on his contract to pay Darrow. In January 1936, a fellow inmate killed Loeb in a bloody razor fight in the prison shower. Leopold was released on parole in 1958 with help from the noted poet Carl Sandburg, who testified on his behalf. He lived out the rest of his life in Puerto Rico, where he died in 1971. However, this case was not the only big case that Clarence Darrow would be a part of. Mm. He was just about ready to tire after decades of practicing law when in July 1925, he learned about a man named, named John Thomas Scopes, who was accused of teaching evolution. Uh oh. <laughs> yep, big bad, the theory of evolution. Haley, it's just a theory. It's not proven. We How could. We came from the sea aliens. We came from Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, that's evolution. That bitch shouldn't have ate that apple. 
And the rib. Ugh, disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> that bitch should have eaten that. That darn Eve. That darn Eve. <laughs> I have all my problems to blame on Eve. <laughs> so Scopes was charged um, of teaching evolution in his science classroom. This was in clear violation of a Tennessee state law that was passed earlier that year. The Butler Act was passed in six days after it was introduced with almost no contest and no amendments. State Representative John Washington Butler, a farmer turned head of World Christian Fundamentals Association, stated, quote, I don't know anything about evolution. I read in the paper that boys and girls were coming home from school and telling their fathers and mothers that the Bible was all nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> he knew exactly what he had to do, and that was not to learn about evolution. It was to attack it. Well, why would you? I mean, you know everything from the Bible. Why would you need more information from a book? If you're able to read the Bible, you don't have to read anymore. Like if you get through that, you're able to, yeah. <laughs> like that's you've a earned. long read. You've <laughs> earned never having to read again. Oh, gosh, that's fair. From, I can't. I couldn't do it. I <clears throat> I tried. I wanted to understand. I tried too, and I gave up. It was very a quickly. snooze fest. Oh, oh my, my god, god, it's so fucking boring. No why wonder would... mega churches exist. I get it. I get it. Why they have to make church fun and cultish? Yeah, you you gotta make it. You gotta add some pizzazz because <laughs> oh boy, that shit's boring. Yeah, people shit on mega churches for all the lights and the music and that stuff. No, that's the only good part. It's their lifeblood. That's <laughs> 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 they literally cannot survive otherwise. <laughs> no, Butler got the Butler Act uh, passed thanks to Tennessee Governor Austin P, who just wanted to gain the rural votes. P apparently didn't actually think the law would be enforced, and he definitely didn't think it would interfere with the education of young Tennesseans. So, it was quite the standoff when the little town of Dayton took a stand against the state and its fundamentalist supporters. Teaching evolution was a misdemeanor level crime for anyone who dared to teach, quote, any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. The charges brought upon Scopes was actually a part of a plan that was well crafted by local coal and iron tycoon George Rappelya and the superintendent of the school district. They wanted to challenge the law and really just bring um, publicity to the mm. town of Dayton, Tennessee. Did the teacher agree? The teacher did agree. Okay, good. So, the, okay, I'm glad he, he was in on it. Be fucked. <laughs> they decided without disgusting, 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 disgusting with him. <laughs> he did agree. He said. He, he said that at the end of the day, he was like, I don't really know if I taught evolution or not. I mean, I believe in it, but did I explicitly say it? I don't know. He said that he may have used materials that included evolution, but his main gig at the school is teaching physics and math. He literally just subbed for the bi biology teacher a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> so he definitely didn't. He definitely didn't like explicitly teach on evolution. And it's crazy because the materials they used were a textbook that A, was a state mandated textbook. So the state is already setting the teachers up to break the law. There was but, evolution in the state textbook yeah. that was illegal to teach. Yes. Yeah. So what do they do? Just like, actually, this might be an effective strategy. Tell the kids don't read chapter seven it's against the law <laughs> don't you read it you're not allowed to read it then they're all gonna read it yeah. and th that's probably the only part they'll remember they'll get clout for for yeah. reading the forbidden evolution maybe chapter. this is a good policy um, i think so i think the forbidden it, fruit it's it like worked. eve and her apple <laughs> Apples, you know, they aren't the same now as they were back in Adam and Eve days. No, they didn't <laughs> exist. Don't even get me started on bananas. <laughs> <laughs> and don't even talk to me about broccoli. Or corn. Corn. Oh, corn's so a big different. one. Maize. 
<laughs> what? Do you know that from the movie Grown Ups? No. With Adam Sandler? No. <laughs> okay. Never mind. If if you know, you know. So, big Adam Sandler fan <laughs> over here. Okay. Big Grown Ups fan. Okay. It's a good movie. I have seen it. I just don't remember the maze part. There's that guy. I forget what the actor's name is, but he's real hippy dippy. And they're talking about like putting corn on the grill or something. Or he's talking about the power of corn. Mm. And he keeps calling it maze. He like talks <laughs> like that. And then everyone's like, maze. It's a whole thing. It's a whole bit that I'm just over explaining now. (laughs) All righty. So the textbook not only included evolution, but it also talked about race and eugenics. Mm. So you can see why some people had issues with kids learning. Yeah. It's almost like textbooks should be updated frequently. Yeah, and I don't even think that it was like pro eugenics. I think it was like talking about, oh, about the, what you like about what, what people is. believe. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah, we should learn about We should eugenics. learn about it. Definitely. But they wanted to stop learning about evolution and mm. eugenics and uh probably systemic racism and all right. that good stuff. Another layer of crazy already said this. The state required that textbook to be used. And Scopes, like I said, he's like, I'm not really even sure if I taught it. We went through posters that depicted what we think is the process of evolution. So he's kind of like one foot in, one foot out. But they decided he'd be the perfect poster child for the cause. And he agreed. Thankfully, the ACLU stepped in early after the Tennessee legislator passed this extremist extremist law, offering to represent any teachers in need of defense. The preliminary hearing was held in May 1925, and they held scopes for trial by the grand jury. They never actually had him like in jail he was allowed to go home at the end of the day without having to post bond and the prosecution during this time was gearing up for this case with the help of william jennings bryan remember that name bryan is one of our main people bryan was a well-known anti-evolution activist who hadn't tried a case in 36 years but this would be the case to bring him out of retirement. Mm, yes. Um, <laughs> you must fight for what you believe in. Naturally. He has to evolve his practice. Mm. The defense was searching for their star team as well. In an attempt to bring even more attention to the cause, they reached out to a famous author, H.G. Wells, and he turned them down because, first of all, he's like, I have no experience in law in Britain where I live, let alone America. So, wait, they wanted him as part of the legal team? Yeah. Why? They wanted publicity. They knew oh, that it they wanted this... a they wanted a celebrity lawyer. <laughs> yeah, it's like calling and he well, wasn't even Kim a Kardashian lawyer. is getting her law degree. That's Call true. Her. She would make more sense for a case like this. Definitely. And that would bring a lot of attention to it. <laughs> the offer was almost turned again turned down again by Clarence Darrow, a well known attorney who had just represented in the defense of Leopold in Loeb murder. But after Daryl heard the news about Scopes and the issue at hand, he decided he put off retirement for one more case. Daryl and Brian had history. They did not see eye to eye when it came to separation of church and state. And Brian, as fundamentalists do, interpreted the Bible literally. So Darrow was highly motivated by this case to not only take down the anti-evolution antics, but to also try to prove that evolution was real. It was the first time he ever offered to do his services pro bono, and he was excited to expose and debunk fundamentalist Christianity. So he's like, okay, if we can do this, that sounds great to me. A media war starts between the men. Journalists nicknamed the case the Monkey Trial of the Infidel Scopes. The grand jury was set to meet on May 9th, 1945. That's not right. 1925. (laughs) Scopes sought out some of his students. Wait, are you sure? Because weren't we in the 30s earlier in this lesson? The Loeb and Leopold case was in 1924. Okay. Let me double check, though, because now I'm wondering. You said 
Loeb was killed in prison in the 30s, which might be what you're thinking of, Kat. Oh. Yeah, okay, oh, so okay. it was. Yeah, this case is in 1925. Okay. I typed it in wrong. <laughs> I, pro- I bet I have 1940s for the rest of my notes, probably. <laughs> I probably just typed it that one time. I was like, yep, that's right. <laughs> So Scopes, the teacher, actually sought out some of his students to testify in the court case for him. That would be so fun. So fun. And you'd have the best college essay. What do you mean? Like, oh, to enter college? To get into college. You have to write, like, a personal (laughs) statement. (laughs) Be a real world experience. Yeah. Like, I testified on behalf of my teacher that taught evolution against yeah. like I took a like, stand yeah against the state of Tennessee it's huge you that can go anywhere you want full ride scholarship full ride to Stanford baby there you get go. that money they definitely believe in evolution there yes I would hope so at least I think <laughs> yeah, I last think time I checked <laughs> so this plan kind of worked it seems like scopes maybe had taught on evolution but the students weren't paying that close well, of yeah, attention. Well, yeah, he was a sub. <laughs> he, no one listens to what a sub says. I mean, God bless the substitute teachers. I love you. Sure. the kids don't listen At the end shit. of the day, yeah, you're just a warm body. I mean, if you're in there for a day. You know, you're just supervising, really. Yeah. That sounds yeah. so bad. No, no disrespect to subs, but, like, the kids barely take their regular teachers seriously and listen to what they say (laughs) so three of the seven students were called to the stand and they did their best but demonstrating their understanding of evolution was rickety (laughs) (laughs) after the hearing one of the students told the press quote I believe in part of evolution, but I don't believe in the monkey business. Okay. (laughs) What part do you believe in? (laughs) His right to believe in it. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) The case pushed on with a trial date of July 10th. Brian, the fundamentalist prosecutor, arrived in Dayton, Tennessee, three days before the trial began, and he made a big show of getting off the train. Half the town had arrived at this station, and I'm telling you, he was posing for pictures, made several speeches, and announced his intentions to completely debunk evolution in this trial. Literally, how did he think? Is this the same guy that said he didn't know what evolution is? That was um, but Butler, the guy who made the act that okay. <laughs> said no, gotcha. no evolution shall Still. be taught. <laughs> I mean, pretty much. Like, how do you how do you debunk something when your only proof otherwise is this book from a thousand years ago says it didn't happen? Because that's all they need, Cat. What? do you mean true why why would you need anything it's the word of god i I forgot directly from god yeah god sat down with a typewriter (laughs) and spoke english Uh uh-huh (laughs) uh-huh direct words from god said no evolution so it was very very theatrical for brian on the flip side for the defense darrow arrived the day before trial in stark contrast to the theatrics he just like got there no fanfare about it the next day the trial began the town gathered and it was hustle and bustle two hours before it began people rushed into the courthouse with many many more people waiting outside and in the hallways the room literally broke out into applause when brian entered the room and then again when he and darrow shook hands and the trial began in prayer Every day after that, the trial began in prayer, led by the judge. So, oh, yes. So that that that's an impartial judge for sure. Isn't no it? biases here, baby. No. There's a reason he why he's both a judge. Sides. Yeah, he's fair. Yeah, he, you kind of look like a judge right now in that dress. I kind of do. Yeah, I'm taking everything you say very seriously. I know you're like locked in right now. Yes, my word is the law. The onlookers outside the courthouse found ways to entertain themselves as Scope students' testimonies were repeated that first day. People set up barbecues, carnival games. It was like a little carnival outside of that courthouse. 
And this was actually the first U.S. trial to be broadcasted on national Mm. radio. So it was a really big deal. After day one, they broke for the weekend and came back on Monday. Again, Monday, the courthouse was absolutely packed with people. The defense argued the scientific validity of evolution in a very aggressive fashion. They were putting it all out on the table, and this was a part of their master plan. Their initial argument was that evolution hypothetically could still be valid through the lens of the Bible, that both of us can win. It can both be true. If you need the Bible to be, you know, at the forefront of the fucking laws, then also evolution can be there. Yeah. The The Bible is a metaphor. (laughs) It's it's an allegory. Yeah. It's not, it's literally, it's been written by so many people and translated so many times. I just, like, I totally understand spirituality and religion. Like, that makes complete sense to me. I can never wrap my mind around religious fundamentalism and taking it word for word serious. That makes no fucking sense. Agreed. It really takes the thought out of the entire process. And I think that I would hope, at least for me, any interest in spirituality for me has come from wanting to get to know myself in the world more. Mm-hmm. But I think when you take everything so literally, it takes the thinking completely out of it. And yeah, it which really... is what some people want. And I think yeah. some people, like the culture of Christianity is more important to them than the spirituality. Yeah, especially if you're raised in it mm-hmm. and that's all you know. Um But it is really unfortunate because it also allows people to just be like, well, that's what God says and not really reflect on what they think is right. Totally. And we're still seeing a lot of that today in 2023, a century later. (sighs) We are proud citizens of Tennessee. God, Um, no, we're not. (laughs) (laughs) Memphis is different (laughs) from Tennessee. We love Memphis. We love Memphis. (laughs) The defense argued the validity of the Butler Act, basically saying it was fine now. We were fine not teaching evolution in school now or before, so why not now? But they were. It was in the textbooks. I know. They just listed all these preceding factors, you know, like from the 1800s. (laughs) And we're like, it's fine now. We don't need to change. We don't need to... (gasps) evolve <laughs> no wasn't it great back then in the 1800s when yeah. we were just going around doing whatever the fuck we everyone wanted was and so happy no yeah. one had any problems no we one all... had any fleas or uh, fleas. slept on the ground <laughs> <laughs> people didn't enslave people right it was great all sarcasm if y'all can't see my eyes <laughs> at one point darrow the lawyer um spoke passionately for over two hours about how the butler act made fundamentalist christianity the most important religion and therefore that made it illegal obviously throughout the trial there were a lot of sassy comments coming from the defense team especially darrow towards our completely unbiased judge john t ralston They argued the judge was biased towards the prosecution. No, the defense, I mean. And I'd have to agree. Like I said, he began each day with a lengthy prayer and directed the jury to not judge on the merit of the law, but on the violation of the act. Isn't that the opposite of what they're supposed to be doing? Yeah, they're supposed to be looking at this law and yeah. being like, is did he this, break the law? Did he break the law? Which, okay, I guess technically he did, but is the law valid? Yeah, okay, yeah. Right? Yeah. Both sides argued about bringing in expert witnesses, saying if they should or they shouldn't. I don't know when bringing in witnesses started being admissible or not in court, but I guess it was still up in the air in the 1920s. But eventually a zoologist took the stand to speak on evolution And then in response, Brian babbled on about some bullshit anti-evolution speech, arguing it ludicrous that children were being taught humans were just one type of 35,000 other types of mammals. And not only that human beings were, and not only that, but that humans were descended, quote, not even from American monkeys, Uh, but from old world monkeys, sir. (laughs) There are 
know American monkeys. Yeah, I was going to say, are you saying American monkeys are true? Is this a Bigfoot believer? <laughs> he might be into dog man. I think, I think I think he's team dog man. Not even American monkeys. Sasquatch. The, the nationalism is just so strong. <laughs> yeah, guess what? He might be on board if they were from, if it was taught that they were descended from American monkeys. <laughs> That is the craziest. I know. Because where did he think Adam and Eve lived? I guess we're, <laughs> we're not descended from American Obviously. humans either. <laughs> well, evolution isn't real, so. But, <laughs> okay. <laughs> In the end, the judge ruled witnesses could be cross-examined, which was the perfect moment because Daryl wanted to call Brian as an expert witness on the Bible. Can you do that? Can you call the lawyer <laughs> as a witness? I think there are almost no rules. <laughs> and he was allowed to do it. The interrogation of Brian about the literal interpretation was epic. Brian contradicted himself so many times and admitted he didn't know much at all about science. <laughs> And since the Bible doesn't give its readers much uh, scientific information, he didn't have much to speak on that. He spoke on the Adam and Eve thing and the rib thing. And Brian declared, and I'm paraphrasing, that he was not answering this these interrogative questions because he had to by court of law. No, no. He was answering because he wanted the world to know anyone could question him and he wants his maker to know that he will stand up for and defend his beliefs. It's not for the law. It's for Sky Daddy. Did you, ever, <laughs> did you ever watch the movie God's Not Dead? No. Oh, you're lucky. <laughs> that's what that, that's what that's that what speech about. just reminded me of. <laughs> if I'm thinking of the right movie, it's about like a atheist professor who like tells every kid in his class that they have to say God's not real and one kid refuses to do it and blah 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 uh, blah blah. Oh my God. There's always an evil atheist in those Christian movies. There is because they're evil. Yeah. <laughs> and they're yes, going to hell. Yes he gets hit by a car. Does yes, he? Yes he confesses that he loves Jesus as he dies oh. and then he dies and they all go to a concert. <laughs> no. They go to <laughs> I a concert. I forgot about the concert yeah, at the end. And the concert's like God's not dead he's surely alive. <laughs> I just love Shirley a lot. Shirley. Shirley. They needed alive. those extra syllables in there. <laughs> Where he is, we know not. <laughs> but he's around here somewhere. Uh. The prosecution questioned the purpose of the questioning. Brian butted in to say that they were just wanting to cast ridicule on those who believe in the Bible. Darrow snapped back, stating, We have the purpose of preventing bigots in ignoramuses ignoramuses from right. controlling the education of the United States and to that I say amen, amen. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> until I say yeah hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> the judge then ruled Ryan's not Ryan's Brian's babbling testimony interrogation would be cleared from the record so it was like, okay, jury, you didn't hear any of that, any of Brian making an ass of himself. Wait, why? Because he did so bad and the judge... Because he did so bad. Ugh. Yeah. Clearly unbiased. Right. He's a good judge. And then, after all of that, Darrow declined to make a closing statement for the defense, which meant by Tennessee law that Brian, the fundamentalist, also could not make a closing statement. Mm -hmm. So although it had been, quote unquote, cleared from the record, the last thing they heard in the trial uh, was Brian making an ass of himself. Uh, Three-dimensional chess. Definitely. A lot of planning went into this. The jury went on to consider everything they heard in the previous week because this trial took eight whole days. <laughs> and do you want to guess how long it took them to come to a verdict? Uh, two hours. Nine minutes. Oh. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Usually they at least like get lunch out of it. I know. Like, I know, totally like, would. Just, oh, yeah. Chipotle. Like, I don't know yeah. if Chipotle's around. Maybe uh, Panera. Big Mac okay. without a patty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm really in the mood for some soggy tomato bread. <laughs> <laughs> um, it took all of nine minutes for them to find Scopes guilty. 
<laughs> of course. <laughs> he was fined $100, which is about $1,600 in today's money. And even though he technically lost, the general public still considered the fundamentalists the losers and supported the need to separate church and state. Quote, anti-evolution laws became the laughing stock of the country. In the following decades, they got banned um, from most states. And then five days after the trial, Brian died. What? Yep. Brian, the fundamentalist. He got smoted. He got smoted, possibly from diabetes, too. Oh, yeah. That, that's a killer. It killed him for sure. God gave him diabetes. <laughs> he did such a good job. He had to bring him home early. <laughs> yeah, that'll do, pig. That'll do. <laughs> oh, it's donkey. Yeah, I was My like, bad. wait, are you calling him a pig? I was, I was getting him confused with babe. <laughs> oh. That'll do, fundamentalist pig. <laughs> a cab. <laughs> All right, I have one last guessing game for you. So the Butler Act in Tennessee banned evolution being taught in schools in 1925 this case also happened in 1925 i want you to guess the year that the state officially repealed the act never no it was repealed okay okay, good it wasn't a trick question uh 1994 Ooh, close, but not really. 1967. Okay, well, that's good. I'm yeah. glad to be wrong. Eventually, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'd rather have the 60s, I guess, than the 90s. Yeah. I would have hoped immediately, but, you know, mm-hmm. it is what it is. Um, Well, that's all I've got on the Scopes Monkey Trial. Wow, good job. Thank if, you. If anyone's curious, I grew up in Tennessee, and my AP bio and my freshman bio teachers both refused to teach evolution. What the fuck? Are yeah. you serious? My AP bio teacher gave me a Bible on the last day of school and said, you're going to need this because I asked too many questions. Uh, uh, As yeah. a teacher in Tennessee, I'm not even a little bit surprised. That's terrifying. And I grew up in Ohio. True. I can't even remember if we were taught evolution. Actually, now that I think of it. But like, I feel like I knew. You're like, by the way, it. what is it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about evolution. <laughs> I just All know I it's is- real. Fine time. Breathing. What's my name? What's my name? <laughs> you go through the whole trial and don't ever look up what it is. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, well, I clearly shit the bed on the opening, so you guys got that play by play from history.com. I liked it. I liked it. A little I mean, misdirect. what would you have done? Just put it in your own words? Yeah. yeah. Like we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I hope you guys enjoyed. I did. It's your turn. Okay. Should we just steamroll the ad break? Alec is Alec is giving out. eyes. We beg not to do an ad read every single week, and Alec forces us. But I'm just gonna go, God, so he saying, can't stop. You're me. saying the quiet part out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Are we really going? Yes, I'm going. Does no one need to pee? No, I'm good. I'm good. Well, I guess I'm outnumbered. You can go pee. We can do this without you. No, keep going. Okay. Uh, <laughs> animal cruelty <laughs> warning. <laughs> I should have gave a warning for my... <laughs> it's fine. Uh, Stupidity warning. Yeah. I... Yeah. Uh, if it matters to you, it's rats and mice uh, that are the victims here. So if, if that informs your decision on whether or whether or not rats. to listen. Rats. <laughs> In the 1960s, human populations were well on the rise and academic institutions began to worry about the possibility of overpopulation and what it could mean in the future of humanity. And this tied into like what the best possible way to design urban spaces would be to accommodate these growing populations. So people began to kind of study ways that or think of ways that this could be studied and predicted. This is when biologist John Calhoun walks in and he is confident he can carry out an overpopulation experiment on mice by creating what he calls a mouse utopia. His plan was to fill a large pen with everything a mouse could possibly need. It would have uh, have unlimited food and water, a comfortable temperature, nesting materials, separate apartments, and of course be free of predators. 
Okay. By creating such a safe environment, the mice could theoretically freely reproduce and have very high likelihood of living to old age. We had a bachelor pad for the mice. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, like an MTV show. We the just Tiff put some, some cameras in. There's a boom boom room. <laughs> They're getting the mice drunk. Imagine a, a mice, a mouse's uh, head Talking head. That's what I'm trying oh, to say. And that would just be like so cute. Squeaking. Oh. So cute. Hadrian, Alex nephew, showed me a video of, it's called like an African something frog. And it's this frog that is a sphere. Like it is completely round. <laughs> and when it's like trying to be angry and like scare off other frogs, it goes. He's using the wrong method. <laughs> it's so I would cute. It pick squeaks. Him up. Yes, I know. Like, he was so cute. And he was all covered in sand and he just Aww. looked so uh, pitiful and cute. Little baby. I know. Anyway, this would allow the mouse population to bloom and researchers would be able to study the effects of rapidly increasing populations. It's interesting that they didn't just put a bunch of rats in the enclosure and just see to see what happened that it was a multi-generational deal well i think they wanted to see what happens when the as the population is growing and how things like progress yeah from like a normal population and then up but yeah they could have just put a whole bunch in there together and this <laughs> rat city rat, bitch rat rat, rat city <laughs> bitch <laughs> 10 10 10 20s on your rat titties bitch, bitch. <laughs> okay so <laughs> this idea was not coming out of nowhere. No, uh, no ideas in a vacuum. John Calhoun uh, was a rat enthusiast. Me too, man. Yeah, he. Well, <laughs> him especially. He was. Uh, this was not his first ratio. Nice. I was hoping you would say that. My dream I knew I, I could feel you hoping. <laughs> it wasn't in my notes. I read it from your mind. <laughs> I'm sure you did. We we are mind melded sometimes. Mm. Hey. You know what? We really are. Because since he was a young boy growing up, guess where? Memphis? <laughs> Tennessee. Not Memphis, okay. but in Tennessee. <laughs> he was obsessed with animals. <laughs> Not rats at first, specifically birds. Calhoun okay. spent his middle and high school years observing, keeping records on, and banding birds. He's an old soul for sure. Oh, he definitely... Um, he had a, some special interests, I think, um, like very invested in whatever he was doing. Oh, is he, that like coded neurodivergence? I think or? maybe I didn't see anything, but like it sounds like because like he was obsessed with birds from a young age. Like yeah. he he was a member as a kid of the Tennessee Ornithological Society. He published his first ever article for them when he was only 15 years oh old. Oh, my God. Like he he was a bird boy and then he became a rat boy. Like he, rat boy. <laughs> and then a rat man. <laughs> All right, man. You yeah. guys know in Curb Your Enthusiasm where what's her name's parents? I forget what even happened. What is David's wife's name? Cheryl. Cheryl's parents, or maybe it's the other guy's parents. But the dad basically looks at David and he's like, you've done something rotten. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, well, never mind. <laughs> That's just what I keep thinking when I hear rat. I keep rotten. thinking rotten. Rotten. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> His passion for animals continued. He ended up earning a PhD in zoology. Then in 1946, joined the Rodent Ecology Project in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins University. The goal of this project was to tackle the rodent problem in big cities. But in order to do that, they had to figure out what factors, behavioral, lifestyle, or biology most drove the rodent problem overpopulation issue and w so like what they needed to target and they couldn't figure that out so calhoun hoped to answer that question by experimenting on norway rats which is just a type of domesticated rat okay yes rat condoms mm. That's what no. they need. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could have been an idea. Um, I don't think he went there, though. In 1947, he began his first experiment in a 10,000 square foot outdoor pen, which contained a handful of rats. He found that even though technically the rats could have reproduced by the thousands, their population never grew over 200 and stabilized at 150. He also saw that the rats 
organize themselves into small colonies of about 10 or 13 rats and any more than about 12 and the colonies became unstable and the rats weren't able to live together peacefully. Anarchy. Total anarchy. We will get to the anarchy. Oh, no. In 1954, Calhoun was hired by the National Institute of Mental Health, or NIM for short, NIM. for acronym NAM. Do you remember the Rats of NIM movie? Yes, and we will get there. Oh. Mm. <laughs> with whom he would continue his rat behavior experiments with. <laughs> Just ratting out. <laughs> he... You could not pry a rat from this man's cold, dead hands. <laughs> he found what he loved to do, and he rat with it. Ah, uh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah, he's been here before. He's mm-hmm. like, next life, I know what I'm fucking doing. <laughs> <laughs> you just pick a new animal. Birds, rats. What comes after rats? Snakes. Yeah, true. Peas in a pod, those three. Yeah, because rats eat birds and snakes eat rats. Do rats eat birds? Nope. <laughs> 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 okay. In 1958, he established shop on the second floor of a large barn in Rockville, Maryland. There, he set up a giant 10 by 14 by 9 foot box divided into four sections. Each section was built to house about 12 rats. So that's a comfortable little family of rats. Yeah, is rat 12. mansion. Rat mansion. We made rat mazes when I was in uh, third grade. That's really fun. fun. We did that in, uh, I think, AP Bio. We got to train the rats to run a maze. Wow. And then it was, like, really sad because then, like, they were just given away to random kids who I'm sure didn't take care oh of them. Oh, my God. Ours, we did ours for our, like, classroom rat pets. Oh, that's so, nice. Yeah, yeah, this one, they were just like, you get a rat, you get a rat. I really oh, wanted yeah. to keep one, and I, my mom didn't let me. Yeah, you could have kept it secret. Just have a little I rat could have pocket. because there was no supervision on who got the rat. I don't think your parents had to sign off. It was <laughs> you want this rat, you do what you will with Free it. Free range ratting. They should have just let them. I don't know. Can you let them go? Probably not. I mean, you could, right? I they don't might know. get they're domesticated. They might get snapped up by a little little yeah, eagle. Just become bird food. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. Okay. So uh, these uh, sections were connected by ramps and each section had access to food and water. On top of the cage was glass so that researchers could walk up the platform and observe the 32 to 56 rats at any given time. It said the rodent smell in this barn was overpowering. Oh, I'm sure it was horrific. Mm-hmm. And uh, Calhoun's passion was uh, building these elaborate mouse environments, and that's always what his experiments kind of focused on. In the early 60s, the National Institute of Mental Health bought a rural property outside of Poolsville, Maryland. This property would hold a number of research experiments, including Calhoun's most famous experiment and topic of this lesson, Universe 25. And I believe it's called Universe 25 because I think, if I'm remembering correctly, this was his 25th mouse environment that he built. Universe. That Universe. is quite quite prestigious. It's dramatic. Yeah. And to, the, it, to the rats, it probably felt like a universe, right? Yeah. Yeah. We'll get <laughs> like, to do it. Do you think there's any other rats out there? A universe, um, a, a purgatory, a hell, whatever Epicenter. you want to call it. Rat town. <laughs> Rat town. <laughs> the idea was, like I mentioned at the beginning of the study, to study the eff- or at the beginning of this lesson, to study the effects of overpopulation. What would happen to social structures when the mice had every need met and were able to reproduce to capacity? In July of what? That's just such a polite way to say that. How would you Reproduce say Reproduce to capacity. Have a lot of rat sex. They're just fucking. They're fucking all the time. <laughs> at first. At first. Oh. In July of 1968, Calhoun introduced 10 albino mice to the mouse utopia. It was a 4.5 foot cube equipped with everything a mouse could want or need. Each side of the cube had four vertical mesh tunnels that led to food, water, separate nesting boxes. The mice were given unlimited access to this food. They were given strips of paper for nesting. They were given water. And theoretically, this space could hold up to 3,840 mice. So plenty Dang, of space. That's a lot of mice. Mm-hmm. And they released how many initially? Eight. 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 Mm-hmm. Eight. All albino? Yes. Why? Um, I think a lot of lab 
mice, lab mice or albino, I think. Why? I don't know. Why don't you know? Because I, I didn't look it up. <laughs> I didn't think you'd ask. <laughs> I'm just going to keep asking why until I get the answers I want to hear. Why? <laughs> why? I'm a three-year-old again. Why? <laughs> why? <laughs> After the mice had some time to adjust, they produced their first litter of pups at about the three and a half month mark. After that, the population doubled every 55 days. Ooh-wee, okay, they're getting busy. Mm -hmm. At the 19th month, the population peaked at 2,200 mice. If you look at just the population growth alone, it looks like things are going pretty well. But there were a lot of problems. In this artificial environment, very few baby mice died. While, of course, in the wild, there's a pretty high infant mortality rate for mice, But this meant that in the environment or like in the artificial environment, there were a lot more juvenile mice than exist in the wild, which doesn't work well for the way mouse society is structured. So mice are very social, hierarchical animals. One mouse will control a harem of female mice. And in the wild, typically if a challenger comes along, they might fight and then the winner gets to stay with the females and the loser runs away to hopefully try again. Okay. Sounds culty. Uh-huh. Only in Mouse Utopia, there was nowhere to run to. You got defeated and then you couldn't escape. Did they kill each other? Calhoun called the losing mice the dropouts. And Beauty school dropout, rat city dropout, <laughs> rat harem dropout, <laughs> go back to the rat. woods. <laughs> <laughs> With so many juveniles, all these male dropouts would gather in hordes in the center of the pen. Oh. And they were restless and angry and had un facilitated testosterone and so fights for no reason would constantly break out these were violent fights these mice were always covered in cuts and scars they were constantly getting fucked up and they were stressed and it wasn't great for the males who actually managed to secure a harem either they too were not safe because there's all these other juvenile mice there's always a younger and stronger mouse so they're constantly being challenged by the other males and having to fight constantly to yeah, protect their females not safe. no and this wasn't sustainable for the alpha mice because if you're constantly being challenged day after day you eventually give up And this is really bad because this meant constant turnover for the female mouse harems. And when a new male mouse would come in, it would kill all the babies. (gasps) Oh, my God. And then breed with the females in the nest. I love how. Okay, I have so many thoughts. First of all, I love and by love, I mean, I think it's really interesting that they're using this study to try and take a look at how overpopulation may affect humans. We'll get to the conclusions <laughs> people attempted to draw from the study. But because yeah, you're touching on an important yeah, it's thing. Yeah, it's clear from the, I mean, relatively yeah. soon that this is not how it would go. I mean, no, just rats societally. are not people. <laughs> We're different. <laughs> Some people are Mm rat-like in in nature. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Um, Yeah, there's there's clear flaws um, with trying to you trying to project. Yeah, and then I'm like mouse experiences on humans. How long did it go on for? I'll tell you. I know you will. This is what I'm thinking right now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Too long. So the female. Would, the females would try to fight back, right? Because they don't want their babies being killed. But with this constant revolving door of newcomers, they too were forced to give up. There's only so oh. long you can fight. Don't rat and ri- mice mothers eat their young sometimes too? Sometimes, yeah. Just depending. Yeah, I think it's a way to like ensure that the other like, ones the live. other ones live. Like if you don't have enough resources for all of them. Got it. Um. So many females took to kicking their pups out of the nest early because they didn't want the trauma. (laughs) Um, But this meant that the pups were being kicked out before they were properly raised and socialized. So they don't have any social skills. 
Some females would run away immediately after giving birth and just abandon their pups to die. And others, like you said, Haley, straight up just attacked and killed their own babies. This is torturous. Yeah, it's I mean, horrible. To even just to listen to. This is awful. Yeah. I had done a lot of reading on this topic months ago for and I just like, like I was I'm not like, ready. I, I was like, I can't teach this. Like this is too fucked up. But we teach fucked up stuff a lot. We do. So I it's was a, like, I can't, I can't give this one the exception. It's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just really, really graphic. Easy. It's really graphic. Yeah, and it's really easy to picture because yeah. you know, we've all seen a rat in their enclosures, and you yeah. can just imagine how bad it got and the suffering. Definitely. Yeah. I don't know how the researchers did it. Like I think Calhoun having done this for so long, he was probably desensitized to it. Yeah. But it, it, it had to have been tough to watch. You know, I don't know. Definitely. And the, the, you know, it's like the ends to a mean, mm-hmm. really. It's like, okay, well, this but will it's give like, us answers. But what ends? Like, this mm-hmm. doesn't really tell us anything. Like, uh, I not to spoil the big reveal here, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Mothers kicking their young out early became a really big problem because now there's all these maladjusted, unsocialized mice who don't know how to act. The females of these unadjusted mice just start like running away and isolating themselves. They're like, okay, if I can just like hide I'll be okay. And they don't interact with any other mice. This is a really unusual behavior since mice are so social. The males developed a different habit. So they also kind of self-isolated, but they'd gather together in groups. And to avoid conflict and interacting with each other, they would obsessively groom themselves. So they would constantly preen and lick and groom and they would just do that constantly and like forget to eat. Like take their fur off. Probably. Yeah. Um, They also showed no interest in breeding. They didn't interact with female mice. They just groomed themselves all day all the time calhoun called these mice the they be- turned into cats <laughs> yeah <laughs> calhoun called these mites the beautiful ones which okay. i feel like is creepy in his work with previous mouse utopias in some of which the mice turned to cannibalism calhoun noticed that bad behavior seems to spread through the population like contagion he called this phenomenon behavioral sink And this term caught on and is now used to refer to the general collapse in behavior as a result of overcrowding. After the population of Universe 25 peaked, it began to plummet. The mice were so stressed and maladaptive, they were no longer interested in sex. When pups were born, the mothers didn't raise them properly. And by the 21st month, pups rarely lived more than a few days, and eventually new mice just stopped being born altogether. It's interesting, and kind of going back to how this study relates to humans, Mm -hmm. I think there is something to take away to speak to how trauma, um, how it impacts our, our lives mm-hmm. and has a ripple effect, um, especially that generational trauma, how that affects these baby rats and how they're maladapted. Um, that's easy to draw the lines between rats and humans. I mean, really any species. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And like depression, you know, PTSD, like those things cause you to withdraw, like lose interest in social activities, lose interest in sex. Like that's absolutely true. Um, but it's still, it's still a tough, like, it's funny because we'll talk about like conclusions different people have drawn from this study and it seems like you can really project any worldview you already have onto Mm. this study and like make it make sense to you um so it's like really hard to look at it subjectively and we'll see or objectively and we'll see um how that goes yeah and especially because it's such an unnatural right situation that and they're just like in. random like <laughs> it's it's, it's, random. it's unclear <laughs> what c- controls there were what the, yeah, i don't know 
So the remaining mice lived out their days in isolation or obsessively grooming. By spring of 1973, fewer than five years into the experiment, which is five years too long, the last mouse died and Universe 25 went extinct. Wow. So they just really let it play out. They, I'm surprised it yeah. went on that long. Yeah, it went on a long time. It's crazy to me that the mice like fully stopped breeding. Like not even a few of them did. Or like once yeah. the population went down, like they were so traumatized and scarred, like none of them ever recovered. Yeah. You look at your hierarchy of needs and their mm-hmm. baseline foundation of security is not being met. Yeah. So nothing else can be built on on that. Yeah, definitely. It makes sense. Unfortunate, but it makes sense. Uh huh. So like we touched on, people were quick to attempt to apply the fate of the mice to that of human society. Calhoun encouraged the comparison, writing, quote, I shall largely speak of mice, but my thoughts are on man. People on every rung of the political spectrum have adapted lessons learned, adopted? What was I trying to say here? Adapted lessons learned from Universe 25 to serve their own agendas. Um, I want to shout out Sam Keen and their article Mouse Heaven or Mouse Hell on sciencehistory.org because they did a really good job laying out and explaining each of these arguments and then answering to their validity. So the next part of my lesson is entirely derived from that article. Mm -hmm. When the mouse study was published, environmentalists were the first ones to run with it, which makes sense because that's kind of what this who this study was for anyway. Sure, yeah. They predicted imminent overpopulation leading to overcrowding and mass starvation and used Universe 25 as a warning to people. Modern scholars have compared Universe 25 to the Industrial Revolution and subsequent urbanization. At the turn of the 19th century, we saw a population boom as infant mortality rates decreased. Then in recent years, human birth rates have dropped and recent studies have shown that young people have become less interested in sex, much like what the mice experienced. Behavioral biologists and eugenicists have used Universe 25 as a case study on the importance of natural selection. Mm. They've argued that the mouse utopia shows that when populations aren't naturally selected, quote unquote, mutational meltdowns occur, leading to stupidity and maladaptive behavior. Jeez. And it's so crazy how all they can try and connect the dots to their own cause mm-hmm. because there are it's just lacking so many um so much substance that we could actually compare to humans yeah. in our society yeah it's um, almost like you, you should fill be in studying humans yeah yeah <laughs> Start just taking data. Yeah. Because now in the 60s, right, when this Mm -hmm. study took place Mm -hmm. would have been the perfect time because the population has climbed, 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 climbed. And I'm sure we have data. I know we do from before the 60s. So just do a study that way. Get a substantial amount of data, information. And And there there are human areas that are overpopulated. Sure. You can just look at that. I don't know. Arguments like these have been politicized, uh, claiming that women in modern society are succumbing to behavioral sync by rejecting traditional gender roles and declining to have children. Meanwhile, men are becoming more feminine. You Uh, know, that whole deal, of course. And evolution Mm. is not real. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We're going to simultaneously argue that evolution isn't real, but also the mice were adapting, uh, evolving to be worse. We can't. (laughs) Gonna, yeah, we're gonna <laughs> oh, not and, pick a and side. that and that we should uh, reinforce natural selection and fittest is is best. Yeah, but evolution isn't real. We're gonna have our cake and eat it too, and you can't stop us. Progressives have also used Universe Twenty Five. Uh, One, to stress the importance of birth control access. I guess if the mice were given birth control, none of this would have happened. I felt like that conversation was going to come up because Mm -hmm. I've heard it, you know, from the conservative side, too, where it's like calling women who have 
several you know a bunch of kids being like oh well they're just doing that to get money from the the government Mm -hmm. and it's like oh well we're not going to give you birth control as (laughs) yeah just blatant hypocrisy yes yeah yeah and blaming it on the people or the mice it's like (laughs) yeah and i i didn't see this in the article but i feel like it could also have been used to argue against like welfare and state benefits like because the mice were quote unquote given everything they needed and Mm -hmm. didn't have to like work in nature blah 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 like yeah and look how it ended up when we just give everything what they need to survive yeah only like again we're not fucking mice Others have applied it, other progressives have applied it to wealth inequality, using the mice to point out what happens when a few aggressive males hoard resources from the rest of the population. That's interesting. Interesting, but also, like, when you think about it, it's like we have males, like, doing that, and, like, they're not, like, the males doing that in the mouse population were, like, attacked, and, like, they... They got overthrown by the masses. <laughs> yeah, we need it, better access to Jeff Bezos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding, just kidding. Um, but it is interesting. Yeah. Me. I mean, it's definitely an interesting like thing to think about and like speculate about and yeah, write about. Yeah, but again, while you may be able to try and connect the dots, it's not they're not on the same level. If anything, what this study tells you about is what happens when you let a rat population go buck wild with all the resources they need. Yeah, it's a great that it's a great you, study on rats. Yes. Yeah. And mice. <laughs> mice. That that's uh, like mice not men. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, it's clear that people see what they want to see, whatever fits their worldview, and extrapolated their own meaning from Universe 25. Environmentalists raising the starvation alarm completely missed the point that the mice were not starving. They had all the resources and food they needed. So that argument is completely moot. It also undermines the unfair resource distribution argument as all the mice had access, equal access to resources. The argument that natural selection wasn't occurring in the experiment also falls apart when you realize that the mice in Universe 25 arguably faced much more competition than they would in the wild. Hordes of dropout mice were constantly fighting for access to females, and males' excessive grooming and females' isolation weren't stupid, maladaptive traits. They were arguably positive traits that they evolved to help them avoid conflict and increased Mm -hmm. their likelihood of survival. Yeah, it was their circumstance Mm -hmm. that caused that. (laughs) Yeah. It wasn't... Okay. (laughs) In fact, there's even evidence to suggest that the mice actually grew more intelligent from the experiment. Really? Yeah. The dropout mice dug tunnels for themselves in the dirt floor. And typically when mice do this, they carry the dirt out of the tunnel bit by bit. It takes forever. It's tedious. But the dropout mice clumped the dirt into a ball and rolled it out instead. Calhoun equates this to humans discovering the wheel. Evolution? It was a massive increase in efficiency, and they only invented the method because they were separated from the rest of the group and weren't taught the bad way. That's wild. Yeah. This led Calhoun to argue that social pressure can actually lead to increased creativity and innovation. The main inference Calhoun made from his work, though, is when social creatures are deprived of meaningful roles in life, they become depressed, hostile, and sometimes violent, which I can agree with. Um, We see this in humans, too. When you don't feel like you have meaning in your life, sometimes you become depressed. When the male mice weren't able to secure a harem, they took to fighting and excessive grooming. When the females couldn't safely raise their pups, they became depressed and self-isolated. But even still, it's problematic to compare mice to humans. Humans can find meaning in so many things besides mating and having babies. So it's a false equivalence. Also, overpopulation in humans doesn't necessarily mean overcrowding. Cities are overpopulated, but we are able to build and shape our environment in a way that doesn't cause psychological or physiological stress. 
I think the most interesting thing to come out of this experiment, though, was the mouse, the mice's increased innovation. I think it's so cool that being separated from the group caused them to problem solve on their own and what they created was better. Calhoun thought so too and then created new mouse utopias meant to encourage the creative behavior. In these utopias, mice were given everything they needed to keep themselves physically and psychologically healthy. No more torture. Okay, no more mice reality TV show. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) we've left MTV and now this is PBS. (laughs) These experiments inspired the book Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, Alec, where a group of overly intelligent rats escape their experimental colony. And that is the story of John Calhoun and Universe 25. Wow. For as dark as it was, that was such a great lesson. It really made me think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Think about the human condition. The human condition. Rats. Mm. Rats, mice. Rats. (laughs) Birds, snakes. Snakes. Everything in between. Thank you for that. You're so welcome. Yeah. Yeah. I I just want to note, too, coming from a family that does a lot of mouse and rat research, that just to push back a little bit, mouse brains, rat brains, and our brains are very, very, very similar. Yes. That's true. It's not a total waste of time to experiment on them. No, for some things. But I think this, like comparing mouse society to human society, doesn't really work the same way as like putting nodes in their brains does right i I just meant like mammalian behavior i think to say that you can't draw any conclusions from the data just because everybody's drawing separate conclusions could be perceived as yeah i just think that this study was not very objective and it allowed for anyone to draw whatever conclusion aligned with their uh predetermined beliefs so there's no way to really like get meaning from it uh, like unbiasedly. Yeah, I just didn't want it to come across as anti-science. No, it's not. Especially coming off of Haley's lesson. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I mean by this at all. And I understand that science progresses and this was the 1960s. I don't think that this experiment would fly today Mm -hmm. just because like it was so uncontrolled and like it seems like this guy just loved playing with building mouse houses and it went on for so long Mm -hmm. i don't know how common it is i guess for animals to be basically tortured psychologically it's pretty common unfortunately it's unfortunately Mm -hmm. common yeah Dang, I yeah. just ignore it. Uh, <laughs> Don't look. Yeah, look away. It's look not away, real. boys. Uh, well, we're going to continue this conversation over on Patreon. I have a fun animal fact to share as usual. Let's see if Haley and uh, Alec have I have a fun fact. It might be considered an animal fact. Good. Let's keep the animal train going. We will see you over on Patreon for extra credit. As always, thank you for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Send this episode to a friend if you want to traumatize them forever. And we will see you next week. Three, two, one. Plastic. Dismissed.